Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Marianne Sasaki. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, we'll cover talk by Buffy Cushman Patz, the principal of a unique local charter school. She gave us an inside look at the current status of charter schools in Hawaii, their politics, and their future. Buffy took a master's in education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education in 2012. As an educational activist and a leader of one of the most advanced charter schools in our state, Buffy is uniquely qualified to tell us about the world of charter schools. She is the principal of a charter school called SEEQS, S-E-E-Q-S. Its official name is the School for Examining Essential Questions of Sustainability. SEEQS is in Kaimuki. It's a secondary public charter school and was founded in 2013. These days it serves some 150 students in grades 6 through 8. It offers an interdisciplinary, project-based, community-based, tuition-free secondary school experience for Oahu families. The SEEKS program integrates core learning in math, science, social studies, English, and the arts with project-based experiences that allow students to make use of what they have learned in real-life situations. It's a very unusual school and bristles with educational creativity. Buffy's passion is teaching through the lenses of theory, policy, and leadership and her on-the-ground experience as a teacher in both conventional and unconventional settings. Buffy got her principal's license while serving on the leadership team of Neighborhood House Charter School in Dorchester, Massachusetts. In 2010 to 2011, she had an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellowship at the Office of Legislative and Public Affairs of the National Science Foundation in Washington. Prior to her fellowship, Buffy taught math and science in public, charter, and independent schools in Hawaii. Her training included a master's in science in geology and geophysics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and a bachelor of science in geology from the University of Florida. Buffy volunteered with Teachers Without Borders in 2008 and 2010, leading math and science workshops for teachers in South Africa. After an introduction by Arky Kale, vice president of activities of the Harvard Club, Buffy gave us a well-informed and spirited report on the status and the problems and prospects of charter schools in Hawaii. How many of you went to public school? How many of you went to private or independent school? How many of you went to a charter school? Some of us are too old to have gone to a charter school because charter schools haven't been around for all that long. Um, so the next question is really, what defines a public school in your mind? And I don't actually mean what characterizes, but what defines? What goes into making something a public school? Funding. Funding. Tell me more about funding. The, uh, usually it's funded by uh, a state government or a local government right. or a school district. Government funding, yeah, public. That's one of the characteristics of, uh, of public. What else defines public? Not selective. Not selective. Anyone can go. What else defines public? Don't worry, I've got the answers on my next slide, so <laughs> if you don't want to add any more. Well, it's free. Say? And it's free. Free is an important characteristic of public schools. Are charter schools public schools? Yes. yes, they are public schools. So here's what defines public schools in my mind, and this is part of why I uh, started with this, because it's actually a common misconception about public charter schools. Public schools, there's no admissions criteria. Anyone can go. It's tuition free. That's another way of saying free, but sometimes people ask, what's the tuition? It's free. It's a public school. Uh, in the U.S. these days, public schools need to be driven by common core standards. Um, I'm going to leave lots of time at the end for Q&A, so if you want to ask me about common core standards, I'm happy to pontificate on those, but that's one of the characteristics of public schools, especially in Hawaii. Um, and also our students have to take state mandated tests, so they have to take the Hawaii State Assessment, now known as the Next Generation Assessment. Um, and it also means that we serve all students, including those with IEPs or in the special education program. These are the characteristics of public schools. Charter schools are public schools. In Hawaii, there are two varieties of charter schools. Anybody know what those are? The Hawaiian immersion is, I, I thought I might confuse things by actually, there's lots of different varieties actually, but if I'm going to characterize it in two, uh, two broad areas, startup charters and conversion charters. So startup charters are charters that originated as an idea. Like, we, I have an idea for a school, I want to make this happen. Um, a facility is not provided to startup charters because 
Basically, it's here's an idea. I want to make this happen. Go find the space. This is in Hawaii. I should be, I, this should be public charter schools in Hawaii is, is what I'm characterizing right now. Although I will soon draw some distinctions between charter schools in Hawaii and charter schools on the mainland as they're typically perceived. Um, so ch startup charters, a facility is not provided. There's no geographic priority for students. So they can come from anywhere in Hawaii if you're a startup charter. And there's an enrollment lottery if there's more interest than there is available space. That's another characteristic of startup charter schools. Does anybody, can, can anybody name a startup charter in Hawaii? Seeks is one, I'll go ahead and give you that one. Seeks is a startup charter. Anybody know any other startup charters in Hawaii? Voyager, Voyager is another startup charter. Voyager Public uh, Charter School. Version, it's in uh, Halal Kumana? Halal Kumana is not immersion, but it's Hawaiian focused. Okay. Yeah, but that one's another startup charter. Yep. UH Lab. UH Lab. UH Lab's are actually its own like variety practically because it was its own school first, and then they they're kind of some are a hybrid between these. Um, but it's, UH Lab is a charter school. Um, there's uh, Kanu Kaina on the Big Island. There's uh, some of the ones you may have heard of in the news. Halal Lokahi was a startup charter school. Um, Myron B. Thompson is a startup charter school. There's, uh, there's actually 35 charters in Hawaii, and I think about 30 of them are startup charters. Mm -hmm. So then there's, a, then there's conversion charters. Oh, I forgot to mention the most important part, that charter schools, public schools, they're publicly funded. Reality is they're publicly underfunded. Um, Do they receive a different amount per student than public schools? Than DOE public schools? Yeah. Yes, significantly different. Mm. So the actual amount that I get to run my school right now, my per people funding, it comes on a stu per student basis, $6,700 per student per year. Compare that to what you might pay to go to Punahou, Iolani, La Pietra, any of those schools. Those are on the order of $20,000 and then they'll ask you for more money <laughs> in addition as part of their annual fund. We get less than $7,000 to run our school. And reminder, facility is not provided. So that actually, rent comes out of that less than $7,000 per student. So it's a little bit hard to actually compare apples to apples because in the DOE budget, they have their budget for running their schools and then the facilities budget is actually a different line item of the state budget. But DOE schools, depending on, actually looking at the superintendent's report that she shared at the Board of Education recently, about 12,000 per student is what they were estimating. Um, and our reality is it actually costs about $10,000 per student. I could run my school on 10,000, I run my school on $10,000 per student, and I just fundraise the difference. Then conversion charters, anybody know a conversion charter? School. Yep, that's right, yeah, originated as a DOE school. Ish, yeah, <laughs> UH Lab mostly counts as that. YLI is a really common one that folks know about. YLI Public Charter School, also Lanikai. Lanikai was a DOE school as well um, that converted. It remains in a DOE facility, so they have a little bit of an advantage in that way. They get to keep their building. They said, we want the freedoms of charter schools in terms of how to run their school. And so they got the authorization to become a charter school, but got to keep their facility. Um, they also s serve students in their geographic area first. So for example, YLI, which is three blocks from Seeks, so it's our close, a close partner for us. YLI serves all the students in the Kaimuki area first, and then if there's additional space, they have students that can en enroll with a geographic exemption by lottery. So there's that parallel there that they have the lottery for the extra spots. So when they converted, did they get their funding reduced to 7,000? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Really it. So basically, it's actually an entirely separate line item in the budget. We don't get our we don't get our funding from the DOE for charter schools. We get our funding from the state. So it's a total different. And the state funds the DOE, and then the state funds charter schools, and the charter commission doles that out to all the individual schools on a per pupil it's basis. Be somewhat easier if your buildings provided. Oh, yeah. They're not having to pay for their building out of that seven thousand dollars, are they? And it's no. 7, Facility, right? right. Yes. Yes. The, they, these folks, my my close friends and, and and allies, they know they have a little bit easier funding funding wise situation wise. We're all in the same boat in terms of it's still not quite enough money to run a school. Um, right. <laughs> Forget that. Most important last last bullet. It's they're publicly underfunded as well. But as you mentioned, they are funded from state government sources in Hawaii. That again. Um, Hawaii is different in the sense of we have our one, we don't have local school, school 
districts. We just have our one school district for the state. A lot of times people hear the word charter schools and sometimes they get their hairs up. I do too sometimes actually. So charter schools have a negative perception in some uh, places for various reasons. On the mainland, and these are, I'm going to give some generalizations, every state's charter law is different. So they're not all the same. Uh, but if I give some generalizations about mainland charter schools, they're operated by nonprofit or in some cases for-profit organizations. There's some states that allow for-profit organizations to run schools that then get public funding. It sounds a little crazy to me, uh, that for-profit part of it, but even though the, the ones that are legit are nonprofit organizations, in Hawaii, charter schools are state agencies. So we're not nonprofits and we're not for profits. We are actually each individual school is a state agency, which has its benefits, like insurance, and it has its and 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 uh, payroll um, benefits. Those things come with being a state agency, but it has its challenges too. In the sense, well, I can get to that once we get to that. Um, in the, on most charter schools are characterized by having teachers that aren't unionized, and this is sometimes a critique of charter schools. Um, again, I'll, I'll preview what's over there. In charter schools in Hawaii, all of our teachers are part of the HSTA. Um, and in the mainland, charter management organizations, known as CMOs, they run multiple schools or networks. So you may have heard of KIPP charter schools, or you may have heard of expeditionary learning. Those are completely varied on the pedagogical scale. Like one is a really progressive and one is a really sort of kill and drill model. But basically you have these organizations that run a lot of different schools under the same model. So it's almost like a countrywide district because they're running the same model in various places. We don't have that in Hawaii. Um, and so in Hawaii, as I mentioned, our charter schools here are operated as state agencies. So I am the executive director of a state agency. <laughs> it's fascinating for me to think about sometimes. <laughs> um, all teachers are part of the HSTA. They don't have a choice in it. They're all part of the HSTA. And uh, our schools all have individualized missions and visions. So there are 35 charter schools in the state of Hawaii right now. There, we don't have any CMOs. We don't have anyone that's all that's, I mean, maybe someday we'll have Sikhs Honolulu, seeks Eva Beach, seeks Maui. We might someday have an organization that would run multiple schools, but right now there really aren't any parallel organizations like this. We were authorized by the new Charter School Commission in December 2012, and then we had our first classes in <coughs> August 2013. There was a really short window bef between when we got authorized and when we started. Um, but it was, we were basically the same age as the new Charter Commission. The new Charter Commission was coming into being right at the same time that SEEKS was coming into being. So we were sort of running parallel tracks there. Now, here's us this year, first day of school this year, 2015-2016 school year. We have 150 students and about 20 faculty and staff. We have these support groups. So I was mentioning that every school has its own governing board. We have a governing board. We also have our Sikhs Foundation, which has a board. And then we have our Sikhs Ohana, which is our parent group. And actually, a plug for our Sikhs Ohana. We're having a big Earth Day event this Saturday, right? 12 to 4 at KCC. And it's crafts and games and uh, tie-dyeing old t-shirts and upcycling of uh, t-shirts in the bag. So and these all have different missions, right? This one, this one is the fun. They'll raise a little bit of money, but it's the, so the fun, the community building. The governing board really has that task of overseeing us financially. Like when we, I have report financial statements to them every month. And our academic oversight, they're making sure our test scores are OK. And then our organizational, are we following state laws when it comes to uh, how we keep records and those kinds of things? Moving into the pedagogy now, a little bit away from from the, the structures, but our school was founded on five core principles. First is that real world situations and real world contexts enable real world learning. Our second core principle is that learning occurs when learners take ownership of their learning. The third is that everyone's a teacher and everyone is a learner all of the time. I think as parents and just adults, we know that we learn from our peers. You know, sometimes you learn things from your kids, and sometimes your kids learn things from you. But all of those things, we really like take that on at our school. 
Our fourth is that a learning environment is composed of its community members, cultural values, and physical surroundings. So what makes Seeks what Seeks is has to do with where we are, who we are, and who's a part of our school at any given time. And the fifth is that improvement of an organization requires constantly collaborative participation by its community members. And we mean students, and parents, and teachers, and administrators, and then the broader community. And all of those folks are constantly working together to make our school better. Students design their own projects. So you hear project-based learning. Ours is student-driven project-based learning. So students are designing their own projects that can be really messy. What's happening here is students, uh, this was our, our essential question was what is the value of plastic? And these students for their project decided to make drums, musical instruments out of all plastic. So they've got plastic tape, some plastic buckets. Um, then they present to a public audience. This is at our public presentations of learning we held at KCC in December. We had about 300 people come and see these students' projects. And the students are the experts. And it means so much when you're 11 and you know more than anyone else in the room about the thing you did. It's so empowering for them. And they get such ownership of their learning by this public presentation. As is customary at the Harvard Club, Buffy's talk was followed by Q&A with attendees at the meeting. Charter schools provide an opportunity for innovation in the public school system. So in the DOE, uh, there's typically decisions are made at the higher level and then and then trickle down through the through the system and in charter schools like innovation can happen right right there with the students teachers and the administrators because it's just a smaller system so change can happen at a lot quicker of a pace and you can pilot new ideas and so you can sort of think of charters as an opportunity for a research and development arm for public schools I'm an advocate of public schools in general and I'm an advocate of school choice and I think that Charter schools provide an opportunity for parents to have choice. Schools of choice that are public, tuition free is really the, the primary thing for that. I think parents should, should examine their local public schools and consider uh, geographic exemptions to non-local public schools and consider charter schools. And then there's also independent schools as well. But I think charter schools add a, a real element of choice for mission-based schools. My school is SEEKS, which is the school for examining essential questions of sustainability. Um, and we're at uh, middle school right now, and we're an interdisciplinary, project-based school that's built around uh, essential questions through the lens of sustainability. Our students do project-based work in the afternoon, but in the mornings they have more of the traditional subjects, English, science, math, history, and arts, and then they get to apply the concepts that they learn in those morning blocks in the afternoon project-based work, and really then do, do things more than just learning stuff. Well, the future, I hope, for SEEKS is that we'll be a 6th through 12th grade school once we find an adequate facility facility that can serve all of our students in Honolulu and the, the future is that we are working in the community and that our students are serving the Hawaii based community while they're in middle and high school and then they can come right after high school and start really making change at the meta level here in Hawaii. Want to know more about Buffy Cushman Pats and her work at Seeks? Check out seeqs.org. If you want to know more about the Harvard Club, check out hchawaii.clubs.harvard.edu. Thanks to Buffy Cushman Pats for presenting this talk and for allowing us to attend. We appreciate the opportunity to participate and to share in the monthly discussions organized by the club.
And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekday afternoons. And then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long. And some people listen to them all night long. If you missed a show or you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash radio. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and our live stream and YouTube links, or better yet, sign on to our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen video studio at Pioneer Plaza. We invite you to come down, see our studio, and join our live audience. Contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. Be part of our civic engagement and raise your awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We want to know what you're thinking and how you feel about current issues and events affecting Hawaii. We want you to stay in touch with us, and we want to stay in touch with you. Let's think together. ThinkTech is now broadcasting 30 live talk shows a week. Check them out. Join us and raise your awareness about the critical changes affecting and taking place in Hawaii. See what's going on. Be a part of the conversation. Check it out at thinktechhawaii.com. Want to speak out about a community issue? ThinkTech invites you to come down to our studio and make a video at our speaker's corner. Contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. Want to join the conversation? Now you can call in and be included in our live shows. While you're watching any of our live shows, just call our hotline, 415 871-2474, and you can pose a question or make a comment. We look forward to getting your call. And now, here's this week's Think Tech commentary.
We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Elise, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times a week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a volunteer, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Marianne Sasaki. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.